My wife does. <laughs> it makes a difference when you're a lifelong member of the community and loved and respected by, by, by your fellow residents of the town of Hartford. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, before we start, I just wanted to mention that our next program will be on November 9th, and we'll have Steve Taylor, who will talk about sheep farming in Vermont. Remember way back when all the hills were denuded? And uh, sheep farming was the, was the big thing, and uh, it evolved into dairy. The dairy yeah. Okay. Um, if you enjoy the program, and we certainly hope you do, I'm, I know that George and, and his wife have put a lot of effort into this. We do have a Lucite box up in the back, and if you wanted to put a wee donation in it, we would really appreciate it because we do have to pay to rent the room. And uh, we're a nonprofit, so that would be lovely if you feel so so moved. And the other thing is, Judy Barr would ask me to mention this. <laughs> this is a brand new Vera Bradley pocketbook, and the Historical Society is, has a $15 price tag. So if anybody uh, needs a handbook, uh, a, a pocketbook, um, actually, where shall I leave this, Judy? Up on the back table. Okay, I'll leave it on the back table, and I'll be on it with him just a second. Okay, oh, George. I guess we're ready to start. Um, my name's George Miller, and I've lived in Jericho uh, all my life except a couple of years um, when we were first married. Um, it's my wife, Linda, and uh, I want to start by um, kind of describing where the Jericho School District was and um, a little bit about my family and then the progression of, of farming in Jericho and it being a hill, hill farm now. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to read some of the type because of there. So I, I must say, though, if you're expecting to hear somebody as good as Steve Taylor, you're probably not gonna. <laughs> and hopefully uh, you look like a pretty friendly crowd, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hold the tomatoes. Um, so the Jericho School District really started, um, goes from uh, Route 14 uh, up Jericho Road, um, on to, uh, takes in Bedell Road, and then uh, Ammo Road, which is presently named Ammo Road and then goes up to Jericho Street. It goes out Miller Road, where we live. And then goes from the other end of Route 14 um, up Jericho Street and out Joshua Road, the last farm um, that's in, in the district. So um, initially there were 14 dairy farms, or 14 farms, and not necessarily dairy farms, um, in Jericho and um, were later described as about three houses that were, had some relation to farms but were single residents. Um, so um, this is kind of my, uh, our family's history, so I'm not gonna go over all of it, I'll just, <coughs> I may be off by a few years one way or the other, but most, most generally I think I've, I've got the time frame down on what happened. So um, initially my great-grandfather moved um, to Jericho in 1909, and um, he came, brought with him um, three daughters and, and his wife. And through the um, U.S. Census Bureau, we could place who lived in what house and how old they were and, and so forth. So with that, um, we had some older pictures. Your next picture. So the picture of um, um, George Nelson Miller, my great-grandfather, and we had stumbled onto this other photo and, and you can see the older man down there. Well, through the Census Bureau, we found that um, his name was uh, Theodore Towner Best, was my great-grandfather's father, lived in the house. And then the older woman there was my great-grandfather's mother. So they, they took care of their own, their elderly, and um, so it must have been a pretty good house full there. <coughs> Some of the early photos of the farm, the horse barn with the, with the checkered door, and there was a, a, what we call the granary. 
um, initially. They stored maybe corn and, and so forth and some plum trees. And, uh, George, is there any way you can get the picture up higher? No, no I don't think so. But you want the lights off? She can't. Yeah, but she can't film it if if it's off. Yeah. So I. Yeah. Please excuse the blurriness here, but um, in the census, um, the 1910 census, was, they moved here in, in 09. So the 1910 listed the family and who were living in the house. And the old census takers were really good. They went from one farm to the other right up the road. So it listed, um, it started with a Charlie Savage that lived the farm below. And uh, then there was an Eden farm out Miller Road and then went over into the neighborhood to a lot of the Lymans and, and who else lived uh, in the neighborhood. So my great-grandfather or great-grandparents had three girls. And um, the story was that uh, my great-grandfather wanted to try for a son. So he, he bribed his wife and to have, <laughs> have another child. So she told him if, if he'd buy her a, a sideboard, a treadle saw machine, and a ringer washing machine, <laughs> she'd have it. So lo and behold, uh, this is 1914, she had twins. And uh, in the lower corner, um, his, my grandfather's name was Chester. And his um, twin sister was Marjorie. And we still, we still. Yeah, we still have the. Um, the ringer washer. No, no, the ringer washer is all gone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the treadle mach sewing machine my brother has, and the sideboard is still in our house today. And they were two, uh, two girls. No, boy, uh, no, a boy and a girl. And a boy and a girl. Yeah. So, so Chester, yeah. yeah. So this is um, this uh, um, Jericho Schoolhouse in about 1914, I guess. Um, at the time, it was white, and they usually had anywhere from oh, 8 to 12, 14 children. So in this 1914 one, um, the, the arrow point on the woman, uh, the girl in the back, is an Elizabeth Bartholomew that lived in what eventually was uh, Elias Lyman's farm and, and now belongs to Rusty Sachs in between with the Robinsons that farm there. And the blonde girl in the front was uh, my great aunt, Christine. And um, so anyway, um, so my uh, great grandfather, their grandparents farmed there for a number of years. And um, then they decided with things must not have been real great. So my grandfather told a story that they moved to Orlando, Florida. So they packed up, sold the farm, moved to Florida with the, um, I guess there was only three kids at home at the time. So I'm not sure how they traveled, whether it was a train or car or, or a boat, maybe, I don't know. And uh, so they went to, um, got to Orlando, Florida. The schools were full. My grandfather said he played in the orange groves all winter long because the schools were full, no, and so he couldn't get in. And it didn't bother him too much, I guess. <laughs> and uh, my great-grandfather couldn't find work, so the next spring, so anyway, he never, never knew when I asked him, well, what year did you move? And he, he was really vague, didn't, had no idea. But through this um, um, school ledger that we have, it shows that um, they moved, um, they left school in um, October 9th, 1924. So they traveled to Florida, and then um, later it showed where they came back in 1927, I guess. So on the way back north after they couldn't find work, they stopped in Hartford, Connecticut, and my great-grandmother died, and she died of pneumonia. So my grandfather always said, oh, he, he was afraid of catching pneumonia, and um, so it, he was always aware of it. But later we talked with my uh, wife, found out from a neighbor woman, uh, Catherine Gibbs, her, her maiden name was Swanberger, and um, that my great-grandmother actually had tuberculosis. And she had lived, slept on the porch, so they must have moved south for a warmer climate, I guess. So meanwhile, she died of complications, really, of, of tuberculosis. So that, this, this one. This is just the next, he gets married. Oh, yeah. So anyway, my great-grandfather needing a wife to help with the um, three kids. Um, Somewhere the family arranged and met up with uh, 
uh, Annie Jacobs was um, from northern Vermont. So, um, so they got married, and along with my uh, Annie Jacobs comes with, was eventually my grandmother, Hazel Jacobs. So she moves into the household. And Oops. yeah, so uh, we just, I went too far. yeah. So anyway, with Annie Jacobs, was enroll, enrolled here in this ledger in 1927, I believe it is, 28. 28. Um, so he, she lived in the same household as my, my grandfather. So they were stepbrother and stepsister. So eventually they did get married, but there was no blood relation <laughs> at all. So, so it was all good, I tell my wife. So this is a picture of the schoolhouse, um, which was a big part of the neighborhood. And the little blonde guy in the middle was my father, Raymond. And um, a, kind of a funny story was, um, one of the young girls in the front is, was um, Jane uh, Joyce Ilsley. And she came up to the farm a number of years ago. It was before my father passed away, but she said she bought some syrup from me and she turned really serious and said, you know, I gotta tell you, she said, when, your father, when we were in school, your father was kind of a bully. And I thought, you know, it's not on me. So anyway, I thought afterwards, well, so I, then I told my father that he was still alive. And I said, uh, Joyce said you were kind of a bully. And he said, who, me? <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, I should have told her, thinking after, I should have told her that I know where he is and he's not very strong right now. You could probably go lick him. <laughs> So now today is the present uh, the schoolhouse. It was painted red. So after it was closed in 1947, um, it was bought by the community as community association in 1951, I believe, and um, for a dollar and other valuable considerations, I guess. So we use it as a community club with potluck dinners and so forth now. And uh, just, this this just... the 1930 census just showing where Hazel. Um, Jacobs uh, lived. So she was born in, in Montreal and went to a parochial school until she moved down here. And some of the first photos of the, that's our house. And uh, there's a horse and sleigh. And of course, you can imagine my great grandfather walking up Jericho and the roads were a whole lot different. You can tell the story about the buying the farm. Oh yeah. So yeah, so he walked, came to town on the train from um, Stanford Station, Quebec. And uh, he walked up on the hill and um, met with the owner and um, purchased the farm for what my grandfather said it was like $1,800. And um, my great-grandmother had sewed the money into his vest, his jacket, so he wasn't carrying it. So anyway, bought the farm and farmed for a number of years. And of course, they farmed with horses. The middle picture, I, it's my grandfather plowing, and um, he wasn't that fond of horses. My grand great grandfather apparently was a good teamster, but my grandfather I don't think was too crazy about horses. Um, they probably didn't work fast enough for him, he being a younger man. And uh, he had told a story that he was out spreading manure down in front of the barn one one spring and it started to rain and, and the horse balked up and he couldn't get him to move anywhere. And uh, so he's getting all frustrated, decided to go back to the house and have lunch. And uh, finally, when he went back, he left them in the pouring rain. The horses stood there the whole time. And when he went back after lunch, they finally decided they want to work. So he, um, he was always, he didn't care for horses too much, I think, because he was afraid that he'd get one that kicked or yeah. they got old fast and uh, pretty soon they worked slow. So. He was glad to get his tractor. Yeah, yeah he was glad when he, he got his first tractor in 1945. In that photo, actually, there's a hay loader, and that's, and the tractor would be pulling the hay loader, so it's kind of reversed, and the, it would, it would pick up the hay on and pitch it onto the wagon that, where somebody would pile it, and then um, from the hay loader and putting in hay loose, um, they they had bale started baling hay. The, um, I'm not sure exactly what year it was, but. Um, 
my grandfather, they had a custom baler, the guy that would come around. So if you bail, uh, you mowed your hay, you got it raked up, the guy would come and bale it the next day and, and you'd pick up the hay. So it worked fine the first year and then the, the second year he had it all ready and for some reason the guy couldn't show up and his hay all got wet and he decided that the next year he'd have his own baler. So and then the progression, so here today we still make a lot of square bales and we've gone to bale in some round bales, some somewhere between three and 500 round bales. So we wrap them in plastic so they can stay outside. And uh, so uh, how many farms are there now? Uh, Jericho area? Dairy. Yeah. Dairy, just one dairy farm, one. ours. Yeah. In the, yeah. When did they start losing the farms? Well, I'm coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this this is a picture of my father and grandfather with deer and, and my grandmother um, with her deer. And she liked the deer hunt. And um, she was really quite an amazing woman. She stood, you know, less than five feet tall and was pretty gritty. And um, she would shoot a deer. She could skin a deer. She could milk a cow. Um, and she could make a Christmas dinner. So. But don't ask her if you did anything. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she wasn't very tolerant of grandchildren either that much, unless you were working. So, okay. yeah. So here, my grandparents, Chester and Hazel, um, stepbrother, stepsister, got married in 1932. So this was their original one of their cars, I guess, and. Um, so the roads were so bad, really, in the 30s that um, if it got muddy, they would park it halfway up, or not even partway up to Jericho. And um, if they were going to West Hartford some, for a reason, they would go down the backside uh, onto Runnels Road. So this one night, um, they wanted to go to the movies, and they had parked the car way down the muddy road or something, and my grandmother liked uh, the movies, and she was going to go to this Nelson Eddy, and, and, uh, and Jeanette McDonald. So they walk down to the car and they get there and someone forgot the keys. <laughs> and uh, and it, it wasn't my grandfather, I can show you that. So anyway, it must have been a very quiet walk home. <laughs> no other two, but the next, the next night they were, and they probably didn't forget the keys again. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, so when they were first married, right the first year of marriage, they went and worked on a farm up in Pomfret, and uh, Mrs. Burbank was a dairy farm. And um, they, my grandmother worked in the house, my uh, grandfather worked in the woods or in the barn, and he had said that the, it was one of the coldest winters. They, they didn't have any heat upstairs in the house, and all they had was a, uh, flannel sheets. And he said, if it wasn't for the first year of being married, they probably would have froze to death. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, when, and then the next year they came back and bought the farm from my great grandfather, and they, they or bought into it. They farmed together. But um, initially, so this was really they had a few cows, so they they would have made butter, and and had a few apple trees, and. Um, <clears throat> They sold whatever they had, with, and they planted a lot of potatoes, and, and they had maple syrup and plums and apples and so forth. So they had their regular customers. They would take that, their goods down, I think, probably once a week, you know, and probably in good traveling. So they had the customers where they would sell uh, butter and, and so forth, to who, whatever, whatever they wanted. And if they had extra butter, they would sell it to one of the stores. So they're at a wholesale price, I'm sure. And, uh, this is Kevin. Oh yeah. So this was, of course, they grew up in the Depression, and um, I remember, and they they did all right, I guess. So I remember, in when I was in junior high, so <laughs> a number of years ago, we had a librarian, a Mrs. Kenyon from West Hartford or Pomfret, and she was a little bitty woman, and um, she 
we got her talking um, about depression. You know, it's kind of how old are you, lady? Did you live through the depression? <laughs> and uh, as young kids, and my friends and I, a couple of friends, um, would rather her, hear her talk than do the report that we were supposed to be working on. <laughs> but she said that um, during the depression, farmers generally did pretty well because they had goods to sell and they had plenty to eat, you know, and they had plenty of work. So they did pretty well. <laughs> Now uh, here, you know, I mean, they they would sell. You know, my grandparents would sell anything from from meat um, to milk, the fruit, vegetables, whatever. And they'd sell wood occasionally. And um, this is at the end of our house. And you can notice the trees in the background. If you can see, um, of course, that's a winter scene. But the trees have grown a lot in in the 60 years. Uh, it's myself splitting wood. So my grandmother kept a ledger, and um, in the ledger, she wrote everything from um, what what they sold, if they had got to pay for a, maybe the milk check, sold the calf for a dollar, um, kept track of everything. The groceries were, you know, five dollars for the week, and gas was six gallons for a dollar. And uh, yeah, well, those were the days, huh? And um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So later on, see, of course, they hadn't gotten, um, well, we can go a little long, a little late. So here, I have a 1946 town report that had all the appraisals of the, of the different properties in town from everything that Sherman Manning owned, which was a oodles and oodles of stuff, to um, every farm it listed, say, the, the Dewey Lyman farm. In, Dolph, or in, in Jericho had, say, um, 200 acres or whatever was appraised price. And um, so it was easy to pick out. They would say Lyman Farm, Jericho, and uh, Miller Farm, Jericho. So we picked them. There were 14 farms. And um, so here, I'm going to try to just um, identify them, who they were. So starting from the south end um, was a farm owned by a Herbert Adams, and uh, now the house is, belongs to Heseltons. Some of the land now um, belongs to uh, Doug Bolger and, and uh, Celia Chan that went with the farm. So, And then the next one up is a Bedell Road, and this, this the older couple up top, is a, it's a Moody Bedell and his wife Lydia. And um, you can see how, how bare the hills are now. It's totally wooded now, except for the open fields kept. So their, their farm was right at the bottom of the hill. It's now owned by uh, John and Ann O'House. Um, there was a few years that um, my grandfather hayed down there. It must have been in the, in the 30s. Um, and they, of course, the buildings are all, all gone now. Um, this is the middle farm. It is, uh, was belonged to a, a John and Beatrice Malone. And it had a big white house that had burnt somewhere um, late 20s to early 30s. And it, now it belongs to uh, Tom and Tracy Osler. They've got a few beef cattle and some cows. So the, the, the smaller, the lower part of the building was a, uh, originally was a log cabin rebuilt on the foundation of the big white house. And they had put an addition. This is at the, um, where my siblings and I grew up with my father and mother. Uh, it was owned in 1946 by Milford and Jane Ilsley. And Linda and I um, purchased it from my siblings um, in my mother's estate. So there's the horses. Um, Milford Ilsley, I think, is on the lawn. But he apparently was quite a good guy with horses and kept horses for years. So that's the original barn now. Of course, the barn's in pretty sad shape now. But we have just used it for hay storage. So moving up the hill is, uh, we go out Ammo Road. Um, that was owned by uh, George and Amelia Sornberger, and uh, now by Cora Bell Ammo. And um, Jane and Bob, her husband Bob at the time um, had torn down the old barn and built them um, in 2013 uh, house on, on the same footprint. So this is a picture that Cora Bell had got us from the Sornberger farm. Um, so it would have been pre, I think the Emmels bought it somewhere in the uh, 60, 60. 60. Yeah, so this was pre-60, and they, of course, took down some of the, the old buildings. Um, this, and coming out our road was um, 
my grandfather and grandmother owned the place. Now Linda and I own it. So I was just getting done milking and we both had dogs, I guess. So, so some aerial photos of 1950 um, of the farm and then today um, of the farm. So I did, uh, we, we didn't get a picture of it, but out Miller Road, there was a, an original farm and um, Dewey Lyman had bought it somewhere in the, in the 20s and um, Marty's father and, uh, and uh, aunt were born in the house. The house since burnt and um, so in the census we did um, find that there was um, a, a family named Ogosh that was living there and, and we never heard the name, but we had referred to it as the Lincoln Farm. So there was a guy, Ned Lincoln, was about my grandparents' age, I guess, and uh, they were friendly with my grandparents. And he got married, and um, his new wife, after time, said, um, said to him, she said, geez, Ned, we ought to get you some life insurance. <clears throat> and he said, well, that's probably a good idea. And um, it wasn't too long after, she said, well, maybe we ought to get a cemetery plot for you too, <laughs> Ned. And uh, so, Apparently, she had plans for him, and he, <laughs> he decided to um, divorce her and, and remarry later. <laughs> and that, that house sent burn in somewhere in the mid-50s. <laughs> so coming back up from Jericho Street, um, I, I'm not um, referring to the very bottom farm, which belonged to my um, uncle Albert Savage. That actually went, the uh, kids from that, uh, they went to Centerville School. So the Centerville School was on Route 14, so the kids from um, Hartford Village to West Hartford went to the Centerville School. So the first farm was a Linda Knott and Lillian, and I do, re I remember Lillian very well. She would sit in the window of the house, and anybody that went by, she pulled the curtain back, and <laughs> they all waved to Lillian. But uh, Lindy milked cows. I'm not sure whether he only milked a few cows, whether he um, ever had a bull tank or not, I'm not sure. But um, you know, he, he had made butter. I remember buying butter from Lindy. He would milk, milk his cows by hand. Was Lily in the second grade teacher? No, no that was Ermini. No. Oh, that's right. Yeah, another knot. So anyway, Lindy, he, his butter would be just as yellow as a dandelion. He made wonderful butter. So the next farm up was belonged to, in 46, belonged to Charlie and Thelma Fancy, and uh, now belongs to Greg Fairbrother and um, the um, tenants that, that rent the, uh, the main farm from them. And Marty, of course, hays most of the hayland, or all of it, I guess. And it was a Josh and Jenny Cuda mansion. They keep a few horses, and they got a, a couple of cows, the heifers, the steers. They got goats and chickens and ducks and geese and rabbits and <laughs> Mice too, probably, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, this I wanted to spend just a few minutes. Um, the Ch Charlie Fancy apparently had sold this farm to a, a, a man named, we called him Frenchy Gauthier, Armand Gauthier. And he was like a major character in, in the neighborhood. Um, in one of the 1950 census, it said that his name was Floyd Armand Gauthier. And um, I've talked with people since, and they're not sure whether his real name was Floyd. Everybody called him Armand. But uh, knowing Frenchy, he very well could have been pulling the leg of that census taker and said, no, no, my name is Floyd. And uh, so I'm not exactly sure if it was Floyd. We never heard of it. He eventually was uh, called the chainsaw artist, where he did carvings with uh, chainsaws. And, and he was a good neighbor. Now, and the next farm up belonged to Olin and Effie Shearer, and now belongs to Dale and Annette Lyman. And on the house, you can see the small windows on the end, that would have been the horse barn, because every horse stall would have had, in a, in a horse barn, would have had a small window for them. It would have stored hay up over for the horses. And this is the barn that went with um, the Shearers, um, and it's really, a, it's a stand, still stands very square. They t there was a milk house right beside the road, um, that's torn down. So we took some pictures inside. It's, it's just a tremendous framework of a, of a barn. And um, so it had um, Marty stores hay in it now. Um, there was an indoor si uh, silo. Um, and then the, the ramp way, the cows would walk up a ramp around the corner into an upstairs stable that still sits there. So the next farm up belonged to a Philip Dewey Lyman and, and uh, everyone called him Dewey. Uh, it was Marty's uh, grandfather, and his, 
his wife Lois. So it now belongs to Jessica and Jeff Mil Miller. And um, so this was really, it was by far the largest farm on, on the hill. They milked upwards to um, 70 cows and, uh, and tapped somewhere 3,000 taps from probably in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And um, one of the hardships in, in farming in Jericho, it's kind of a dry piece of property, and uh, there's not a lot of water on dry summers and so forth. So um, they hauled water a lot. And uh, so it was an extra um, chore that they had to um, endure. And uh, so down the road, it, the house, the farm belonged to a, um, Eugene and uh, Lita Lyman. So it now belongs to Jerry and Charlotte Lyman um, for a number of years. Uh, so Eugene apparently was quite an orchardist and had, had large um, apple orchards and did a lot of grafting. One of his trees in one of the orchards uh, had six different kinds of apples um, that were grafted onto it. And so, yeah, so the next farm is, was belonged to a Frank and Daisy Wallace um, and now belongs to Pat Zikarski. And the Frank Wallace, um, he never had a tractor. He, he farmed with horses into the mid 60s. And um, at one point, um, Daisy passed away and um, he was all, all ready to sell his, his farm to the first guy that came along. And, uh, and uh, the guy said, you know, um, calm down, Frank, you know, you'll feel better in a few days. And he ended up selling it to the second guy that came along, <laughs> <laughs> which was my aunt and uncle, Walt and Jean Kudemarsh. And they, they had farmed there only really for a number, a few years, uh, 10, maybe 10 years, no, not even 10 years. And, um, but, Frank was quite generous. He had bought Walt a tractor. He bought Gene a car, and uh, all the children on a new bicycle. So us cousins were kind of jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so the next house, and this house actually belonged to a Frank and Gertrude Knott. Um, now it belongs to Stephen Martha Sass, and uh, I guess they have plans on fixing it up, and, and it's laid empty for a number of years. So in 1938, um, Glenna and Avison Lyman, my great aunt Glenna, married a, a Lyman. They lived here in 1938, and they had heard that the listened to the radio that there was a hurricane coming. <laughs> well, unfortunately, they didn't tell anybody else, so they got caught unaware. And um, my grandmother tells that she and her mother and my three-year-old father um, ran to the barn and and and. Uh, rode out the storm in the barn and the barn lost half the roof and, and they lost a lot of tre maple trees and so forth. In the barn, you know, the, yeah. So anyway, this, uh, this other house um, was, belonged to, I'm not sure they, they owned it, but they lived there, was a Joseph and Emma Brown. And I believe they probably worked for Frank Wallace because Frank Wallace, I think, owned, owned this house and um, belongs to Chet and Candy Miller. Um, now and it was, it was said to be a parsonage for a Methodist church that was on the corner of the Sugar Top Road. The so yeah, the church was moved to Heartland, I guess reasonably intact, um, is part of the um, North Heartland um, general store for a number of years. And um, if you go down Sugar Top, um, this is um, belonged to an Ernest and Margaret Stetson and now belongs to Rob and Colleen Hanel. And um, see, Rob and Colleen had done a lot of work to some to the foundation and put a new roof on it. And uh, so the Hanels moved in, I think, is it 66? Uh, 66, 65, 66. Yeah, so anyway, um, Rob's father, um, Bob Hanel, was quite, a, quite an ingenious guy and he had, he had uh, built a rope tow and um, he had parked the car up on the, on the top of the hill and took a tire off and the big rope came down. And, and so a, a lot of the neighborhood kids would go over Sundays and uh, Bob would fire up the, car, the old car and, and we'd ski. And of course it wasn't a big hill, but it was big enough. So the next farm going up the hill was, belonged to uh, Alice and Elias Lyman. And now belongs to Rusty and Marlene Sachs. And, um, 
they had torn they had torn the barns down. So within this, um, not too many years after Elias, um, I talked with George Robinson, which is in the in the audience here. And George said his his father and mother bought the farm in 1954, and when they first got there, they only milked 12 cows, and um, which was probably on average uh, many of the other herds. So, and this, this farm apparently had a very big apple orchard on it. And uh, it was said that they had uh, uh, 52 different varieties of apples. Um, and they were, of course, a lot of the apple orchards uh, were, were um, cut down because of the, to make more hay land for the expanding dairy herds. So this is the last um, farm. It was belonged to Ermini and Merton Knott. Um, and the, the house and barn are actually just across the Norwich line. And uh, I, Merton actually had it pretty good, I think, in reality, because uh, his wife worked out, so she had off-farm income, <laughs> which, which was, I'm sure, quite a help. She was a local school teacher um, at the schoolhouse for a number of years and then went to Wilder. So, you know, so anyway, the transvi transition time really um, was it's from 1946. Everybody was expanding their herds and um, wanted more farmland. So um, Dewey Lyman had, um, he had bought um, the neighboring farm, the Shearer farm, um, just next, next to their farm to go to enlarge their herd. And then Merton Knott bought the Stetson farm on Sugar Top. And uh, Chester Miller, my grandfather, bought the Illsley farm down on Bedell Road. So, and, and then after 1946, many of the farms started to be sold to, to non-farmers. Um, like the Adams farm down at the very bottom was sold to a, a man named McCormick, which sold the house and a few acres to the Hazeltons. And then the Sonbergers um, sold their house, um, their farm to the Amels. And then uh, the Malone farm that was sold to the Oslers. Um, and then the Bedell farm, uh, yeah, the Bedell farm was left to a family member in, uh, from Massachusetts that came and spent summers there. So it was really kind of the, the enlargement of the farms, uh, expanding her dairy herds. And um, then um, sort of the value of the, of the land was starting to become too valuable for farmers to own, that more people were buying the uh, farms and, and splitting them up. So then the transition really in the, so it went, things went along pretty well, I guess, for some 50, 10 or 15 years. And then, then more farms got sold. Um, Dewey Lyman had sold his farm, I think, 63 to 65. And part of it was uh, he had health problems, had um, apparently part of a lung removed. And, and um, one of the sons, Norman, had a bad back. And uh, so anyway, they chose to sell the farm. And then Frank Wallace, of course, sold his farm in 1965 in, uh, to Gina Walcoot Marsh. And then they sold it to a developer who um, kind of quite quickly split it up into uh, six or eight uh, lots. And, uh, so, and then Alberta Parker, which Bunny Parker, which was a uh, daughter to um, Eugene Lyman. And um, she had married a guy named Charlie Parker that was a dairy farmer. and. Um, he, was, he had uh, wanted to expand his herd, of course. So he ended up, I think, from um, much to the chagrin of, of his father-in-law, that was quite an orchardist. He ended up cutting down a lot of his, many of his apple trees to make more hay land. Mm -hmm. And the, the little side story to it was when they cut down the apple trees behind the house, they hired uh, Armin Gothier to blast the stumps out. And, um, <laughs> And you could buy dynamite at the hardware store at the time. <laughs> and uh, so Armin would s stuff the piece of dynamite underneath there, and, and he'd light this really short fuse and run like crazy, laughing, laughing, boom! And everybody would say, well, Frenchie, why don't you just get a longer fuse? And he said, cost too much money, cost too much money. <laughs> and uh, he, was a, he was a tremendous character. <laughs> So then Merton Knott sold his cows. I'm not sure if it's 71 or 70. Um, and meanwhile, the, the Robinsons had, had uh, bought the farm. Joe, uh, George's father and mother, Joe and Dot, 
bought it from Elias Lyman, and um, they farmed for a number of years. And then George, um, George's father passed away in 1966, and when, when George was only 17 years old. And uh, so George had, had just gone into the Navy, that he told me recently, so I hope I get this right. Yeah. And uh, he had just finished um, the, um, at Great Lakes the boot camp or whatever they call the Navy thing. So George ended up coming back to the farm and, and, um, and ran the farm and ended up getting deferments um, because it, um, the government really knew that the farmers should stay on the land and be producers if, if there's wars going on. So George ran the farm until um, um, 1972, and um, he ended up selling his cows because, because the Knott farm was sold. George had a lease agreement with him, with uh, Merton, um, to use his land. And when, when the land, when Merton wanted to sell his land, George lost the lease, and um, so it was he was going <laughs> to lose all the crop land. So he was kind of forced to sell. And then um, at that time, 72. Um, many of the other farms down below um, on Bedell Road and so forth were never, never actually put in bulk tanks. They, um, they might have shipped milk in cans, but um, so in the, yeah, I should back up a little bit, but um, in the mid -six, early 60s, farmers were forced to put in um, bulk tanks and milk rooms and so forth. And a lot of older farmers said, you know, I'm not spending that kind of money and I'll just um, sell my land or so forth. So mostly, the, I don't think um, the Sornberger ever um, shipped milk. Um, uh, a few of them, um, Ilsley may have, but um, um, not for long. After my grandfather bought it, he just used the barn for hay storage and uh, um, used the hayland. So um, by 1976, there were only three farms in Jericho. And, in uh, Armand Gothier and, and Chester and Hazel, my grandparents. And then uh, in 1976, my, my folks and I started the dairy farm on Bedell Road. So, so with a lot of the farms going out of business, um, there, there was opportunity for um, people to come in um, and make hay and sell hay to horse people and so forth. So my father had bought equipment and he started, he used um, a lot of Bunny Parker's land in, um, and so forth. And then um, I'm not sure exactly what year Marty came, Marty and his brother David came back to the neighborhood and um, started in the hay business. And um, so today, um, Marty Hayes probably at least half of the land in Jericho. Uh, Tom Osler hays a small portion and, and uh, we hay the rest of it. So in uh, 1976, we started. Uh, my father was, was a mechanic by trade and um, he didn't farm with his father only for a very short time because uh, apparently it wasn't that their personalities were, were the same. I think they were quite different. And so they couldn't get along very well. So, um, but when my father decided he wanted to be a dairy farmer, then, then uh, he kind of got the okay from his father that he was doing something right finally. <laughs> and uh, so myself with a dog, my mother, um, she helped me milk for 25 years, and uh, she said she'd rather rather wash the milk house floor than having to sweep up her house. So, <laughs> oh yeah, so yeah, so we had had we had cut a bunch of hay um, in the early 70s and had a few animals, and we had, had pigs for a year. So we kind of my father and mother pieced together a living, and then um, my. Of course, I had always wanted to be a dairy farmer because uh, my grandfather was. I had a couple uncles that were. And um, so my, gra my father had bought some heifers. And when um, I graduated from high school, they were due to calve. And we, we started shipping milk and shipped milk for 39 years at the Bedell farm. How many cows did you milk? We eventually, well, to the end, we milked 60 Holsteins. And then uh, my, I got the bright idea to to start in the cheese business in 2007. <laughs> and uh, so we built this cheese plant. And uh, my sister and I, we made cheese. My wife, Linda, was um, the definite marketer. She went to um, yeah, the farmer's markets. And she still worked out. And we did it for about five years. And I said to my wife one day, I said, we're not doing this to kill ourselves. <laughs> but 
And then, uh, so we ended up um, getting out of the cheese business. But in the meantime, another small cheesemaker um, asked if we would produce milk for him. Um, and it's called Springbrook Farm in Reading, Vermont, and they make a, a raw milk cheese. And so they come and get our milk. So it was a, it was a good out. And um, by the time the commercial price in, in 2015 was going bad, and um, I wasn't going to go through the same work like crazy and not make a dime. So we sold the Holsteins and we had, and we purchased a few jerseys. So we now milk 30 cows. And uh, yeah, so if, if I backtrack a little bit here, um, so my grandfather got his first tractor in 1945. He had to put your name in on a list. And uh, when they, because after the war, they were making tractors finally. And um, he had a tractor come up, his name was on the list, and a guy called, and, and uh, the guy ahead of him on the list said, no, he didn't have the money to buy the tractor. And he said, well, I know a guy that does. And um, so he called my grandfather up, and he was pretty tickled to get a tractor. Um, oh. so, so he went from you know, bailing a few bales of hay um, to feed his cattle and expanded his herd. So they didn't get to, um, talking to Marty's uh, dad, uh, Bud Lyman, um, over in the neighborhood. They got the electricity in 1938. And it wasn't until like 1945 did, did my grandparents, they were in the offshoot of Miller Road. And at the time they had, if you had milked five cows, they'd put five poles in and so forth. And um, he, he had wanted um, George Swarmberger um, to put his cows in to get electricity. So I'm not sure whether he ever had electricity or not. No, not while he was no. out at the very end of his life. Yeah. So anyway. They just had three, three bulbs. Yeah. 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 So George Thornberger wouldn't get, he wouldn't get electricity. So then he couldn't get to my grandfather. My grandfather being a younger farmer, and um, George, I'm sure, was a pretty older man by that time. So they went a number of years more without electricity. And, um, in uh, my grandmother's ledger, they would go to Lebanon and buy ice box of ice and uh, store them in the sawdust so they wouldn't melt. And uh, their original coolers were held 40 quart milk cans, and um, they might have been six or eight cans or whatever they were shipping. And uh, it was in an ice water bath, and and they stirred. So, so anyway, one story my grandmother had said she was helping the milk truck driver lift those milk cans out so he could get them onto the truck. And this one day, she was bent over trying to lift that can and the guy pinched her butt. And, <laughs> and she said, that was the last time I helped him. <laughs> and he's probably pretty lucky he didn't get a black eye. <laughs> yes. yeah. So anyway, this today we have solar panels on our barn roof which um, is a net meter and deal, so we haven't had an electric bill since, um, well, they keep sending us this bill, but it says zero, zero, zero on it. <laughs> yeah, and so here's a sugar house uh, my grandfather built in 1952. Um, so anyway, this, um, yeah, so it, we still use it today. We had built a cupola on it. Originally, he just opened the doors, and uh, so we still use it today in uh, gathering sap from um, some trees that my grandfather, my great-grandfather, would have um, tapped. So, and like backing up a little bit, um, from cutting hay and, and baling hay, then they put up silos. So my grandfather built two silos, and then they would fill them with um, chopped hay, so haylage. So my father and my, my sister Norma and my mother there, dad was the, the mechanic, so he was working on the chopper. And so they would fill the silos for more feed. And, uh, and along with all the extra equipment they had, um, they had built this tool shed um, to store equipment under. And it, we never really got a picture, but at, on the left side, the horse barn, they tore down and built a uh, new cement block building for a milk room. In, in 1962. And so these are buildings um, where we try to keep everything under cover, and certainly in the winter when we can. And the little tractor driver is my granddaughter, Josie. <laughs>
and so it's more of this uh, tool shed and some round bales. So initially, uh, so on the right the milk house today. Um, we use a, a pipeline system. But um, before they built the milk house, um, they would take the, the milking machines to the house to, to wash because they didn't have a wash from there. And uh, this is a, a, a picture of the buildings uh, um, on Bedell Road that um, my grandparents built. So the, the arrow point to the land on the Bedell Road that in 1953 when they bought it, they could sit on the porch um, and see the whole field. And now today, um, we can only see it from like way up behind our house. So the trees have grown so. So um, these cows grazing um, in 1950, my grandfather had kind of a little bit of everything. And uh, we've got jerseys now, uh, grazing the same pastures. They beat down the, uh, beat down the grass. They've been chewing grass off that land for a long time. <laughs> so. Just talk about Google Maps. Oh yeah, so this, road leading down the hill ends up tying on to um, Runnels Road and um, but it's a about a mile of on of class four road and but Google Maps still will send somebody up uh, <laughs> Runnels Road to get to Jericho uh, to Miller Road because it's it turns into Miller Road it's on the left and so, <laughs> Even the, just the other day. yeah the other day someone yeah had gotten lost so yeah so today um we still, we had planted some plum trees and apple trees. So, so in milking the 30 cows, selling the milk to Springbrook Farm, we end up kind of reverting to the old style of farming and, and makes it much simpler. Mm -hmm. And um, so we can make they pay much better than um, than a commercial price. So it's kind of a, it's a good deal for us. And some of the pictures of the farm. And this is Bedell Road. Of course, at, mm -hmm. when we farm, when we milk cows on Bedell Road, we had three silos and um, stored full of corn silage. We had planted 40, 40 some acres of corn at that time, and now it's quite a bit of a relief not to have to do that and travel quite as far for for hay land. Using other yeah. So yeah, and so we for for the 39 years. We didn't own very much land. We used a lot of land from from neighbors, pasture, hayland, and so forth. Most of it rent free, and uh, so we were very lucky to have done that. And so, r really, we um, I thank a lot of our neighbors for allowing us to use the land and so forth. So we've been very fortunate. Our neighbors are generally pretty tolerant for a little bit of manure strewed in the road, and <laughs> <laughs> not a lot, but they. <laughs> They've been very tolerant with us, so um, if you want any questions, I don't know whether they talk too much, my throat's getting kind of sore. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the story of your father, the mechanic, when he was driving the concrete truck. Oh, what's that? When, you, when your dad was driving the concrete truck for... Oh, he, uh, he had... Any, 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 when they were building Monshire Restaurant? Oh, I don't... I'm not sure I heard this one, no. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. So how many acres do you have right now, George? We own about 220 right now wow. with, with my mother's farm. So we, we actually really, it's, in a way, it's kind of a struggle to, to own it. You know, it's a privilege and so forth. But um, hopefully um, my wife and I can get through um, and not have to sell any of it. And then it'll be up to our kids or other family members. It'll fall on them if they have to sell it. <laughs> we'll be off the hook. <laughs> yeah. When they throw yeah. up Runnels Road. What's that? When they throw up Runnels Road to Class Four, that that last stretch. Oh well, it was always um. Since I've been alive. Yeah. Yeah, I put gate, uh, I put fences across, but um, you know, if somebody wants to get through them. Um, a couple of years ago, I'm sitting on the porch, and the, this guy comes with a street bike, and he said, oh, does this lead to Route 14? I said, yeah, but you don't want to go down that road with that bike. And uh, so it's really pretty unpassable with a, with a Jeep or car. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, my grandparents, when they were, well, probably 30s and 40s, um, they would travel that way, um, but all the roads were rough. 
Uh, so, yeah, I didn't um, mention, um, it must have been the 30s to 40s, there was a program, a government program called the WPA. It was the work progress. So they, they fixed up a lot of the roads. And um, yeah, it was called the WPA, but my grandfather referred to them as whistle, piss, and argue. <laughs> So, they, but they did a lot of road work. So eventually, milk trucks and so forth could come, come up through, and they changed the road a lot. I'm sure Corabel remembers that the road um, coming up by your place was much lower to the brook originally, right? It was, yeah. They said that was the muddy part. Yeah. Uh, and the road, there was a road that went up by your. Farm. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, Catherine Sornberger and her sister used to yeah. walk up and pick up Leonard and Chester when they walked to school. Oh, yeah, yeah. As she said. Yeah. I don't know if that really ever was a town road, that Reynolds Road. Because I know Randy Reynolds used to fence his end down there, and his grandfather fenced his end up on that. Yeah, road. yeah, I but. I think that was an old stage road that kind of assumed to be. Well, they. I don't think the town would have maintained that road. I don't know. Mm, they may not have maintained it, but they still own the right of way. <laughs> because of the, yeah, they had trouble with a logger um, this past year. Um, he wanted to use, use it that way and uh, Runnels guys kind of objected. And then the town uh, road commissioner got involved and he said, well, if you put in any material, he said, we're gonna have to leave it open. You won't be able to put any fences across and so forth. So I'm like, yeah, all right, we'll go out the other way. So. Yep, see ya. Both Bedell and at Miller Road? Yeah, we have some at Bedell Road, and we have some Jersey, the heifers, a couple of dry cows, some beef cows, and um, with some calves. So we, uh, there's quite a lot of pasture there that we keep. I guess there's 16, 18, 20 head down there. But the milking cows are always at, at uh, Miller Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Pat. Well, I've got a couple and they're really good shape. They're retinned and I ended up, I gave one to my son for Christmas and I told him, I said, that's one of my most favorite possessions. Take care of it. So I, you're not getting mine either. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. in the historical society, I mean, realistically, it was a railroad town, but there was a lot of agriculture that went on in the town of Hartford. Uh, Queechee was a, a big farm area. We're the last dairy farm in the town of Hartford. Yeah, wow. producing milk. Yours is the last dairy farm? In the town, in the town of Hartford. town of Hartford with yeah. 30 cows. Yeah. Wow. Really? Hmm. So you stick it out a few more years. <laughs> yeah. But did the Savage family have a farm in the district of Jericho? No, no, it was on Route 14. So that was actually, they called it Centerville. Um, so the school was where Bergeron's equipment is there now. And so it, Centerville, I guess, was probably the same number of students, but they were on from the um, Hartford Village to West Hartford. So any kids in between went to um, Centerville School. Yeah. Yeah? you farm with your, uh, with your uh, children? No, no. Uh, my, my cousin works for us, and he's older than I am, so. But, uh, and uh, my, I got a nephew that milks, helps occasionally. But no, my, my, my son, I always said, he grew up on a farm, but he wasn't exactly a farm boy. Because <laughs> if I ever wore one of his t-shirts to the barn, he'd give me hell. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be dirty. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, he, Alex said one time, he said, I could have been a really good farmer. I said, I'm sure you could. And he said, but I never wanted to work that hard. <laughs> so he was honest about it. I mean, he, he works hard at what he does, but he didn't really, he appreciates the farm now. But um, getting him to do chores was like pulling teeth. <laughs> But, yeah. yeah, David? George, of the 220 acres, is there even one that is flat? 
and you know, not, not bigger than a pickup. <laughs> That's a fact. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Or? You probably had some farm accidents along the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I got run over by a menorah. Yeah, yeah, my Sandy. Yeah, of course, growing up, you know, all us kids, um, we did what we had to do. Well, we generally did what we were told, but <laughs> to help, um, you know, with the family's chores and such. And Sandy fell off the tractor. She couldn't have been uh, 10 or 12, 10? Uh, oh, 14. Oh, should have known better by then. <laughs> but um, she, of course, the tractors didn't have uh, fenders. And she's riding on the drawbar and hit a bump or something. No, 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 no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so the whole story is Dougie was driving and Red Pocket was on the back. And it was when Jimmy Carter was running for presidency and, and Pocket was from <laughs> had a southern accent. And I'm being a teenager girl and I'm giggle, giggle, giggle. And the next thing I know, I fall off. And, uh, so the, the wheel, yeah, the wheel of the tractor, clunk, clunk. Manure spreader, yeah. But didn't get seriously hurt. Um, Jerry? Tell them about the Christmas caroling. Oh, yeah. With the, in the neighborhood, um, um, with the community club, we do a Christmas caroling um, every year. And generally, we haven't done it for a couple, I guess. But uh, Marty would load up his truck, and it would be 20, 30, 40 um, people. And we go around to the neighbors, whoever kind of volunteered to have a uh, have a stop, and would sing Christmas carols. So do a lot of um, community stuff. Were they used to sing to the cows? Yeah, oh yeah, they'd come to the barn and, and <laughs> sing to the cows. That was their highlight. My cows, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. She, well, she picked. Yeah, she did the upper half. Yeah. And the lower half. Another. We were on the lower lower road, and um. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> the guy had a big Cadillac taxi cab, and uh, uh, John Johnson. Yeah. Uh, they, when we were. Yeah. 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 So that would have been, yeah, but when when we were younger, of course, there was a lot of. It was different because her mother, his mother, picked up the Ramones, but didn't go out the end of the road with the. Yeah. Well, we were, they were in the Ilsleys probably by then. It may not, none of us. I remember in the, after Malone, then it was Oslis. Yeah, right. Because of the Oslis. Oh. The last on we, never, we never took Oslo for a year. Yeah, and then, this, then they split it up. There were a lot of kids yeah. um, in my she class. Was two loads, of, two loads yeah. twice a day. Yeah, there were a lot of kids really there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jerry? Yeah, Going up Jericho Road and a 57 Pontiac by Mrs. Johnson yeah. in Hartford. The car used to go up sideways. Yeah, there was there was a mud hole that. Oh. on one side and the rear wheel yeah. going up the road sideways. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I got a quick story to tell you about your old grandfather. I was uh, helping out with some hay up in Jericho District about 50 years ago. Shifted a 22 Ruger pistol. Really? So I decided to go up halfway up Remington Road where the old Ruger bus was on the Yeah, yeah. Well, I set up some soda cans and I did a little plinking and I was taking my time and I see your grandfather coming down the roadway and he didn't look too happy. Oh, yeah. I'm in trouble now. So he asked me who I was and I introduced myself and he says, I hope you haven't been shooting into that bus like a bunch of other characters have. And yeah. I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, I'm going to take a look. He walked around that bus and he says, you're an honest kid. He says, 
Have some fun, but be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could be pretty stern. He actually, he had mellowed a lot when we were, when we came along. I think with my father, there's a story with my, my wife and I remodeled the house, and and in the wood box, by the wood box, he had written. My father had written in chalk. Kilroy was here. It was like 1945, and. Um, I'm not sure who my father thought he was going to blame it on. He was the only child. And so, so we kept the board, but I'm sure he got a licking for it. Were there any other questions or comments? If not, I think we owe George the Thank you. Very much, yeah.